Good afternoon. This presentation titled Raising Her Voice, Collecting, Digitizing, and Teaching with Diverse Archival Collections. I'm joined by Candace Pine, Rare Books and Manuscripts Librarian at Miami University, Dr. Jasmine Sutton, Assistant Professor of History at Miami University, and I'm Jack Lewin Johnson, the University Archivist at Miami University. And, and we are located in Oxford, Ohio. The land acknowledgement. Next slide, please. Miami University is located within the traditional homelands of the Miami and Shawnee people, who along with other indigenous groups, ceded these lands to the United States in the first treaty of Greenville in 1795. The Miami people whose names are, and our university carries were forcibly removed from these homelands in 1846. In 1972, a relationship between Miami University and the Miami tribe of Oklahoma began and evolved into a reciprocal partnership, including the creation of the Miami Center at Miami University in 2001. The work of the Miami Center, Center serves the Miami tribe community and is dedicated to the revitalization of Miami language and culture and to restoring the, that knowledge to the Miami people. Miami University and the Miami tribe are proud of this work and of the more than 140 Miami students who have attended Miami since 1991 through the Miami Heritage Award Program. Next slide, please. Our diversity, equity, inclusion, and, and accessibility, DEIA statement. Miami University it, adheres to the Miami University de definition of diversity, which includes, but is not limited to, race, ethnicity, color, nationality, sexual or orientation, gender identity and expression, class, religion, disability, age, military status, visa status, economic status, geographic location, and language linguistic ability. We will actively work to ensure that the tenets of diversity and anti-racism anti influence all aspects of our work, including as it relates to our collection, services, spaces, and people. We are committed to working together to create spaces and systems that foster a sense of belonging and inclusion and are accessible to all. Next slide, please. Today's presentation focuses on, um, focuses on the work of two African American women in their collections. Dr. Carolyn Jefferson Jenkins, educator, voting rights activist, first black woman to serve as the national president of the League of Women Voters, and Jenny Elder Sewell, retired nurse, resident of Oxford, Ohio, who was a leader in her local church and a leader in the black community of Oxford. Okay, we can go to the next slide, thank you. And can everyone hear me okay? All right, so um, hi everyone, um, I'm Candace Pine. I'm the Rare Books and Manuscripts Librarian at Miami University, and I am going to be discussing Dr. Carolyn Jefferson Jenkins and the collection of personal papers that she has donated to us over the years, as well as how we hope to use her collection to help highlight the voices of Black women in our archives. So I'd like to start by going into a little more detail about who Dr. Jefferson Jenkins is. I think that will give you um, better context for when I talk about how we'd like to use the collection in the future. So next slide, please. All right, Carolyn Jefferson Jenkins was born in Cleveland, Ohio, and she was the first person in her family who went to college, and she went on to become a very well-educated woman. Um, she earned her Bachelor of Arts degree in Social Science and Education um, from Western College, which was uh, later absorbed by us, Miami University. She also earned a Master's in Education in Administration and Supervision from John Carroll University, as well as an educational specialist degree from Kent State University. Plus she earned a PhD in urban education and administration from Cleveland State University. So Dr. Jefferson Jenkins went on to have a very successful career. Um, but before I talk about that, I wanna take a moment now to recognize her grandmother, Barbara Blaine, for being Jefferson Jenkins' biggest inspiration um, because I think it's really important to acknowledge the legacy that Dr. Jefferson Jenkins came from. 
So her grandmother, she taught in a segregated school in Arkansas for 22 years. And even after she retired, she kept teaching. Um, and Dr. Jefferson Jenkins witnessed this. And she once said, quote, I can remember her teaching people who could only sign X's for their name, how to read and write. That really inspired me. It made me want to become a teacher. That's all I ever wanted to be, end quote. Additionally, Blaine was not able to vote until she was 63 years old when the Voting Act of 1965 was passed. Um, but before then, uh, Dr. Jefferson Jenkins saw Black people like herself and her grandmother not being allowed to vote, um, and about which she later said, um, quote, it brought my attention to the dissonance of what I was told to expect as a citizen and the reality of what happened, end quote. So it was this mindset of valuing education and having the right to vote, both instilled in her uh, by her grandmother, that carried Dr. Jefferson Jenkins on to have a very meaningful career. And next slide, please. So Dr. Jefferson Jenkins began her career in 1974 teaching high school. Um, later, she went on to become the assistant principal at Max S. Hayes Vocational High School. And then she went on to become the principal of Taylor Academy. And currently, she is serving as an adjunct assistant professor at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And in addition to her work as an educator, Dr. Jefferson Jenkins has also been deeply involved with the League of Women Voters for many years. And next slide, please. So in case anyone isn't familiar with the League of Women Voters, um, this is how the organization described itself on their website. So they say, quote, the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan, grassroots nonprofit dedicated to empowering everyone to fully participate in our democracy. With active leagues in all 50 states and more than 750 leagues across the country, we engage in advocacy, education, litigation, and organizing to protect every American's freedom to vote, end quote. And you can learn more about the organization if you're interested at uh, www.lwv.org. And I actually, I also quite enjoyed the story of how Dr. Jefferson Jenkins got involved with the league. Um, so what happened was um, the group was sponsoring a candidate debate um, and she really wanted to go. So she called the league to ask for tickets, but she was told that only members could get tickets. Um, so she wrote the league a check and became a member. And then later she showed up at a meeting and asked, you've got my money, so what do you do? <laughs> um, and that's what marked the beginning of a very fruitful relationship between Dr. Jefferson Jenkins and the League of Women Voters. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, um, as Jackie mentioned, she went on to become the 15th president of the League of Women Voters, um, and she was the first person of African-American descent to hold the position. Um, and she also became uh, the chair of the League's Education Fund. And then in October of 1999, she was even featured in Ebony Magazine, and we have that issue in her collection. You can see um, a little excerpt from it here. And next slide, please. I also wanted to quickly touch on some of the major initiatives that Dr. Jefferson Jenkins supported during her early years in the league as that really showcases the kinds of activism that she believed in. So there was the Wired for Democracy campaign um, that used emerging technologies of the time to help educate voters. And she also helped to create the Democracy Network website, which was used for getting information about candidates and issues out to voters, as well as stimulating conversations about them. Um, and actually, a version of this website still exists today. Um, it's now known as vote411.org. Um, so you can check that out if you're interested. Um, Something else was the Get Out the Vote campaign um, that worked towards turning the tide of citizen participation in elections. And Dr. Jefferson Jenkins participated in this campaign by assisting with registering voters, organizing candidate debates, and using the media to encourage people to go to the polls. And then there was the Take a Friend to Vote campaign, uh, which built upon that Get Out the Vote campaign to continue to help increase uh, civic participation in voting. And all of this is just a small sample of the kind of advocacy work that Jefferson Jenkins has done over the years. Um, she certainly kept herself very busy. And next slide, please. Uh, something else that Jefferson Jenkins is known for is being a writer. Um, she has contributed her writings to numerous journals and books over the years. Um, however, some of the work she's probably best known for include The Road to Black Suffrage, one Man, One Vote, The History of the African-American Vote in the United States, and The Untold Story of Women of Color in the League of Women Voters. And next slide, please. 
And what else is Dr. Jefferson Jenkins doing now? Um, well, she continues to write and speak at events to advocate for voter rights, civic engagement, fighting against voter oppression and discrimination, et cetera. Uh, she also works with educational organizations, nonprofits, community-based organizations, and policymakers as a consultant in the areas of leadership, policy, and practice. And uh, more recently, um, on March 12th, 2020, Dr. Jefferson Jenkins was awarded the Freedom Summer of 64 Award from Miami University. Um, the award honors leaders who strive to advance civil rights and social justice in America, which she has certainly done. Uh, plus, she was also the commencement speaker for us here at Miami University for our spring 2021 graduating class, and we were really thrilled that she came to speak for us. And next slide, please. Okay, so now that you know uh, a little more about who she is, let's talk about the Carolyn Jefferson Jenkins collection that we have at Miami University. And next slide, please. So first off, how did we get the collection? Uh, well, it came to us in two separate parts, actually. Um, so Jefferson Jenkins made the original donation of her personal papers to us um, around 2003. And this was when a previous archivist, um, Diana Kaufman, was in the department. And then our current university archivist, who's here with us today, Jackie Johnson, um, she first discovered the collection for herself when a graduate student came in and requested to look at the materials from the collection. So since then, um, Miami University, as well as Jackie in particular, um, have maintained a relationship with Jefferson Jenkins, um, and so she's remained involved with the university um, over, the, over the years. She's been invited to attend as well as speak at various events on campus, um, including being our commencement speaker two years ago, as I just mentioned. Um, she was interviewed for an oral history project that was being done by the university, and she's been awarded um, with various honors, such as that Freedom Summer of 64 award that I also just mentioned. Um, so as you can tell, the university, as well as our special collections department in particular, have made a clear and consistent effort to maintain a relationship with Dr. Jefferson Jenkins. Um, and this came in handy when um, Jackie, our archivist, as well as our digital collections librarian, um, Aaliyah LaVar Wagner, um, they approached Dr. Jefferson Jenkins with the idea of creating a digital collection of her materials. And fortunately, she supported the project, which led to her making an additional donation of materials over the course of 2020 to 2021. And as a result of that, the collection has about doubled in size. And next slide, please. So then what? <laughs> After receiving this large new donation, the materials needed to be organized and arranged. And thankfully, we were able to hire a graduate student during the summer of uh, 2021 to process the materials, uh, which she did a really fantastic job with. And you can see a photo here of uh, some of the products of her hard work. We have a number of uh, very nice folders there that were all ready to go into their boxes. And next slide, please. Then the next step was to digitize the collection. Um, however, we needed some funding for the project first. Uh, so our university archivist and our digital collections librarian, they applied for a grant opportunity that we have available here at Miami University from a program called the Miami Giving Circle. And the Giving Circle is made up of Miami alumni and friends, and they create grants to fund programs on campus and in the community. And as part of the application process, our digital collections librarian, uh, Aaliyah LaVar Wagner, um, she had to make two fast paced pitch videos. And then she was later um, interviewed about the project. And fortunately, her hard work paid off and they got the grant and they were able to move forward with digitizing the Carolyn Jefferson Jingett's collection. Um, so Aaliyah has been organizing and overseeing all of the digitization of the collection to make sure everything is done up to the best possible standards. And she's also been able to involve a number of our student assistants in the project, which has been just a huge help. Um, and that's also part of what the grant funding covered. Um, so the students have scanned all of the materials and created just a real wealth of uh, metadata about each item. So we really could not have done this project, um, at least certainly not so quickly without our students. So I have to give all of them as well as um, Aaliyah just a huge shout out for all of their hard work. Well, next slide, please. All right, so now that the digitization portion of the project is starting to wrap up, um, what comes next? Uh, well, the first step will be reprocessing the whole collection to fit uh, the original and the new donations together. 
Um, so I have been working on creating a reprocessing plan for the collection, which um, should hopefully get everything all organized into a logical order together. Um, and then our goal is to hire a graduate student, hopefully this summer, to physically reprocess the collection as well as update the finding aid in archive space. Um, so that reflects the, the new materials and the new arrangement, uh, plus links out to the new digital materials that have been created. And another goal that our digital collections librarian has um, once the whole project is finished and everything's reprocessed um, is hopefully for us to be able to fund some research with the collection. Um, we especially want to encourage uh, some interdisciplinary research with the collection that will highlight uh, Jefferson Jenkins's work and contributions to many different areas. Um, so researchers who are interested in, in topics such as education, politics, advocacy work, um, you know, women and gender studies, et cetera, um, they could find this kind of collection useful. And we hope that by digitizing the collection and making it available um, online through our website, uh, we'll make it able to reach larger audiences um, outside of our own campus community who will be able to engage meaningfully with the collection. And next slide, please. But of course, we do want our campus community to engage with this collection as well. And there are a few different ways we can try to make that happen. Uh, we plan to highlight the collection around our department and in our library um, at large by using materials from the collection in various um, displays and exhibits. Again, within our own department, we have our own exhibit space um, and then scattered around the rest of the library where we have other display cases and things set up. And the staff in our department will also be able to discuss and show off materials from the collection um, in various presentations that we give, like I'm doing here today, um, as well as in other outreach efforts and programming that uh, we are a part of in the department. Uh, plus, we can showcase the collection on our various social media platforms and in our blog posts on our website. And furthermore, we'll be able to use the collection in the classroom. Um, so when relevant, uh, we can bring in materials from the collection and incorporate them into our teaching so our students can engage with the materials. That will give us the chance to raise awareness about Dr. Jefferson Jenkins and her collection. Plus, it will provide us with the opportunity to discuss the importance of having her voice, as well as others like it, heard and represented in libraries, archives, and special collections institutions. And that is why digitizing and sharing this collection has been such an important project for us. It will help us to highlight and amplify the voice of a powerful Black woman, which in turn helps to make our archives a little more inclusive. And we will keep working to do the same thing with more and more collections, hopefully, so we can continue to become a more diverse and inclusive archive. And next slide, please. So, and we hope that uh, those of you here already um, already are or will be able to take on similar projects of your own at your own institutions um, from finding ways to highlight and amplify voices of people who come from traditionally marginalized communities to digitizing materials for wider use to cultivating relationships with donors whose materials ideally will help diversify your collections. Um, it's all rewarding work, but more importantly, it's necessary work that can help us to paint a broader and fuller picture of the past as well as the present, and then share that story with as many people as we can. So I'm going to end on that note, and then now I'll turn things over to Dr. Jasmine Sutton. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? I'm working from two computers, so if, you, if it looks like I'm not looking at the screen, I am. You can't? Okay, great. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. So my name is Dr. Jasmine Sutton. This is my first year as an assistant professor in the Department of History at Miami University. And my portion of the presentation will discuss a method I have termed descendant archival practices and how I have used that method in the collection of one African-American woman to teach a course on Black women in America at Miami University. As a historian of Black women's history, my work is situated at the intersections of slavery, in critical archival studies with a particular interest in what local history and digital technologies can tell us about antebellum Black women and their descendants. My current book manuscript examines Black women's transition from slavery to freedom in antebellum Indiana and Ohio. It focuses specifically on the Black settlement of Greenville on the border of Randolph County, Indiana and Dark County, Ohio. And if you look on the map, the house is where the settlement once existed and then a few counties down, you'll see a book, which is represented by where we are at Miami University. 
Within this community, I'm especially interested in the ways in which Black women navigated social and legal obstacles to develop ideas of liberty, carve out space for themselves as citizens, and ensure family survival on the frontier. As a doctoral student at Indiana University, it did not take me long to realize I would not be able to write a traditional history of antebellum Black women in Indiana and Ohio. Local archives did not hold a single collection, folder, finding aid, or directory related to antebellum Black women. In fact, detailed recollections of their lives almost never appear in the historical record at these institutions. So while I was able to piece together fragmented records to get a general idea of where Black women lived, who enslaved them, the kind of work they did, the names of their family members, and the locations of their grave sites, for years I did not know how they articulated their own ideas of freedom or if they had anything to say at all. After seven years of research, I found Black women's voices in two sets of digitized records made accessible through university libraries. The first is the Students Repository, a student periodical based out of the Union Literary Institute in Randolph County, Indiana. Black girls and young women published essays in the periodical during the Civil War on the importance of education, good character, morality, and usefulness. Physical copies of a few issues are available in the George Washington Flowers Memorial Collection at Duke University Library. The purpose of the Flowers Memorial Collection, as the library website reads, quotes, is to collect materials concerning the history and literature of the Southern United States. George Washington Flowers was a Civil War Confederate officer from Alexander County, North Carolina. His son was Robert Lee Flowers, president of Duke University from 1941 to 1948. The final, the final place in which I've been able to find Black women's thoughts are in the Josiah Parker Quaker Collection at Earlham College. In 1829, a formerly enslaved woman named Hannah Elliott wrote to a Quaker woman in North Carolina, quote, we are well consented, better satisfied than in Carolina. Prior to relocating to Indiana, Hannah was considered Quaker free, a status generally prescribed to enslaved people, manumitted and practiced by Quakers, but legally still in bondage. Earlham College believes Hannah's letter is the oldest surviving letter written by an African-American in Indiana. The historical paper trail of Indiana and Ohio's first generations of Black women is dispersed across various records written by individuals other than themselves. Evidence of their lives accompanied their movement from the South to the Old Northwest and across boundaries of slavery and freedom. We find glimpses of their lives in North Carolina and Virginia's court and manumission records, in WPA narratives of formerly enslaved people, in private papers of slaveholders, in the accounts of Black refugees in Canada, in organizational records of religious groups such as Quakers, in local newspaper accounts expressing white discontent with African-American migration, and in the personal collections of university presidents and professors like Indiana University's Andrew and Theophilus Wiley. History is a series of strategically curated decisions, to borrow the words of archivist Dominique Luster. As historians, archivists, librarians, and everyday people, we have the power to make decisions. Decisions to either uplift some or silence others. Rather than relying on mainstream archives that have traditionally excluded or marginalized the voices and experiences of Black women, I started to draw on the innovative methods of Black women historians. I turned to methods like critical fabulation as a style of historical writing that is both semi-nonfiction and critically speculative of the gaps and silences of official records or like Black feminist historian Marissa Fuentes, to approaches that allow us to write about enslaved women despite the violence and distortion of the archive. And like historian Taya Miles, I concentrated on the actual material, the things enslaved people touched, made, used, and carried to understand the past. When I started to look beyond what constituted the archive or official record, I discovered the Greenville descendant community disrupting cycles of archival oppression with technology. The community's Facebook page, Remembering Freedom, preserves 1,191 photos of historical documents and 12 years worth of posts that serve as a gateway to broader discovery. By the time I learned about the Greenville descendant community, 
Individual members have been for over a century compiling, writing, and publishing family histories. To assist in the research process, a collective of descendants shared records and oral histories with me, visited local libraries, and later sent their findings to me in the mail. Indeed, our relationship was mutually beneficial as I shared my findings with them as well. Convinced that there was more to learn about Greenville's women and that their descendants were the key to unlocking that knowledge, I participated in the community's annual homecoming at the Bethel Wesleyan Church in Ohio in, Ohio in 2019. In advance, I organized with the permission of the community a history harvest. My goal was threefold. One, recover historical evidence of Black women's lives outside of mainstream archives. Two, create a more complete and diverse understanding of Indiana and Ohio's history. And lastly, contribute to the digital toolbox descendant communities use to share and disseminate their own histories. The Remembering Freedom History Harvest was a jointly developed project between the Greenville Descendant Community and a group of researchers and student volunteers from Indiana University Bloomington. Like other history harvests, the Greenville community came together with university partners to share and contribute their stories, photographs, and artifacts in an open source digital archive. Twelve members of the community participated in the harvest and contributed hundreds of individual items. While I am aware that others create digital archives with data and access in mind, my main objective was to amplify the archival practices of descendant communities and create resources for future researchers to write about Black women during slavery. I am a traditionally trained historian who turned to digital humanities when both archivists and historians suggested that it was impossible to write a substantial history of rural Black women in the antebellum Midwest. Within my work is an ethic of care that is often absent in traditional approaches to historical research. In addition to advancing my own research agendas, I'm committed to providing people outside of academia with the tools, skills, and data to conduct their own research and preserve their own histories. At the same time, I acknowledge the expertise and authority of descendant communities who have historically archived themselves. As Jessica Marie Johnson writes, Black digital practice is the revelation that Black subjects have themselves taken up science, data, and coding. In other words, have commodified themselves and digitized and, me and, me and mediated their own Black freedom dreams in order to hack their way into the system. Modernity, science, the West, take root and live where they were never meant to survive. Of all the DH tools and methods available, Minimal computing is the most simple, in my opinion, and the most effective for the work that I engage in with students and communities. It is, a, it is an approach to digital technologies that doesn't require high-tech hardware, software, or technical expertise. Rather, for the local community, it is easy to use, low-cost, and sustainable, and for researchers and the wider public, accessible and easy to emulate. My introduction to DH and the deafening archival silence around Black women's lives led me to the historical method I have termed descendant archival practices. Descendant archival practices began as a mixed method approach that involved identifying, collecting, preserving, and making accessible through digitization, cultural heritage, and archival material considered valuable by descendant communities. It draws on a variety of archival sources found in mainstream, home-based, and community archives, as well as material culture and oral histories to reconstruct the lives of Black women. At its core, it acknowledges descendant historical knowledge as an authoritative source and an alternative to mainstream archives. Descendant archival practices began in the community through the history harvest approach, but it's taken new shape in the classroom. In the fall of 2022, as a newly hired professor in the Department of History, I arrived at Miami University in search of connections to Oxford's local African-American community. More specifically, ways to incorporate their perspectives into my courses on African-American history. With the assistance of archivist Jackie Johnson, I discovered an Oxford treasure. That is, Jenny Elder Sewell and the collection she donated to Miami University in 1993. Jenny Elder Sewell was born in Allegheny County, Pennsylvania on March 17, 1904. 
Her maternal grandparents were born enslaved in Kentucky. While her paternal ancestry can be traced back to her white grandfather and Cherokee Indian grandmother in Nebraska. Because her great grandmother did not approve of her son marrying a native woman who was also the family's domestic servant, the couple moved to Cincinnati where they married and had Jenny's father. Jenny was the firstborn and last living child of 16 children. She attended Withrow High School and Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. She would go on to earn her nursing degree in New York and then return to Cincinnati to work at a public health center treating tuberculosis patients. After marrying Clifford Sewell, a Miami University chef with familial ties to free black people in North Carolina, she moved to Oxford, Ohio. There, the couple adopted a daughter who became an honor student at Miami University. Jenny spent the rest of her life as a community leader, providing housing, meals, and entertainment for Miami students and contributing to the local Head Start program. She was also an evangelist, a steward, and Sunday school teacher at the local African Methodist Episcopal Church. In 1994, a year after Sewell donated her family's collection to Miami University, the university created the Jenny Elder Sewell Distinguished Woman of Color Award in her name. She passed away in 1999 at the age of 95. The Jenny Elder Sewell collection consists of a plethora of documents, bills of sales for enslaved children, freedom certificates, photographs depicting Jenny's career as one of the first African-American nurses in the country, a letter from a teenage black girl seeking and then being denied admission to the university in 1910, organizational memos, newspaper articles related to her life and more. So at this point, I'd like to share with you all how my Black Women in America course at Miami University is currently using descendant archival practices to research and learn about Black women's history. In general, my course Black Women in America examines the historical experiences of Black women in the United States from slavery to the present. However, every major assignment is related to Jenny Elder Sewell's collection. The first assignment was a document analysis using the contents of Jenny Eldersoul's collection in the format of a blog post. The assignment requires students to identify the source, describe the contents, analyze the contents, and then evaluate the document, particularly thinking about how it reflects a particular historical moment in African-American women's history. Eight students presented their work at a program hosted by the university archives. Using those same documents along with research conducted in class, the second assignment involved the timeline of the life and legacy of Jenny Elder Sewell, and you can see some of those examples on the screen. The third assignment consisted of interviewing via Zoom two Black women from the local Oxford community who knew Sewell personally. Our plan is to eventually add those transcripts to the collection. And I feel like it's also important to note that through our organization of these interviews, one volunteer, Martha Sue Brown, another local African-American woman in Oxford, has recently donated a number of documents related to Sewell's life, including her obituary and various photographs. The final assignment in our class is a memorialization of Sewell's life in the form of an unessay which promotes the use of digital technologies and allows students to choose the method by which they would like to present their research rather than being restricted to a written to writing a traditional research paper. A few examples of students' work so far include the creation of a children's book, poems, songs, archive directories, and a clothing line. And speaking of memorials, as I worked on the final edits of this talk, one of my students sent the following email and photos that you see on the screen. And I hope that it can, it can illuminate the significance of descendant archival practices in the classroom. The email reads, hello, Dr. S. It's the perfect weather for a stroll through the cemetery. Since you value local history, I thought you might like to know that Jenny's marker is in the same cemetery as two black Civil War soldiers. It took me a while to find them when I first looked for them last year, so I thought I'd attach some new photos I took this afternoon. If I were more able-bodied, I'd give the markers a good cleaning, but alas. I've also attached some links, in, some links with their info in case you haven't heard about them before. Peter actually worked at Miami. There is also a cool historical marker for a jazz musician, but I haven't really looked into him. 
I call it Jenny Elder Sewell and her collection an Oxford treasure because their value should not be understated. As a historian of Black women's history, I know firsthand how rare it is to come across a collection this extensive. And by extensive, I'm referring to the time periods and topics the documents cover, the quality, not the quantity of those documents. Historically, Black women have chosen to keep their historical documents within their families due to a lack of trust in predominantly white institutions. But that wasn't the case for Jenny Elder Sewell. She donated her collection to Miami at the request of her grandmother-in-law, Nan Sewell. Nan Sewell was a Black woman born in 1825, North Carolina, during the period of enslavement. A local Oxford resident in her adult years, Nance recognized the importance of Miami University housing documents that highlight, that highlight the tough questions our nation continues to debate. Whose history matters and whose doesn't? Whose life matters and whose doesn't? These are not new conversations though, and Nance had to know this, yet she chose Miami, the institution that her family members labored at in domestic service roles, the institution that did not allow Black students to live or eat on campus in her lifetime, which is why Jenny and her husband Clifford opened their home to them. And finally, the same institution that in the 1960s forced Black students to walk out of class and stage a protest, demanding the university hire a Black professor to teach African-American history in the Department of History. As I stated earlier, we have choices to either uplift or silence. While Sue's collection is valuable in revealing those issues, her own words, thoughts, and feelings appear seldomly in the records. I'd like to leave you all with two of her quotes. According to Sue, when African-American students in the 1960s would arrive at her house furious about the discrimination they were encountering at Miami, she would say, and I quote, let's have a quiet hour. L let me get the Bible. Let's read some passages and, and think quietly and see how you feel then. She went on to say, I've learned in all my years that you are responsible for your own actions. You make the decisions within yourself, whether to love or hate. And last but not least, she revealed, and I quote, people ask me, how should we classify you? As she had African, Native, and European ancestry. To which she would respond, American citizen. Jenny Elder Sewell was an American citizen, a Tuskegee graduate, a campus nurse and preschool caregiver, a local icon to worm reporter and an Oxford treasure, in my opinion. Her collection isn't just Black women's history, it's Oxford's history, it's Miami's history, it's American history. I'm excited to announce that next year in the same course, my students and I will be digitizing the Jenny Eldersoul collection in partnership with the university archives and hopefully local community members for the creation of a digital archive and website. And I'm going to conclude my talk there. Thank you. And that is all that we have for you guys here. So um, we are now able to open things up for questions if anybody has questions. Um, hi, uh, Dr. Sutton, could you repeat the three um, methodologies in the history harvest that you participated with the political community? I was trying to fiercely write them down and I didn't get them all. Can you ask that again? I, I heard oh. the three methodologies that I mentioned for the history harvest. Yes, could you just repeat them? Um, I was like recovering historical evidence of something and I missed the rest. Oh, okay. Got you. Got you. One second. So I can write them down. Uh-huh. Um, give me one second. I'm working from two computers. Um, okay. Um, so, and, and these are my individual objectives for the history harvest, but not how others have approached the history harvest approach, just so I'm, I'm clear with that. So the first one I said to recover evidence of Black women's lives outside of mainstream archives. And my reason for that is because I have been doing this work um, for my dissertation for about seven years. And 
I could not find many records of African-American women. And it wasn't until I started to create those relationships with descendants who were keeping these documents in their homes and posting them on their family Facebook pages that I was able to find enough um, primary source documents to write the dissertation. And so again, the first one was to find records outside of mainstream archives, because if I depended on those archives, I wouldn't have been able to write the dissertation if I depended solely on those archives. The second one was to create a more diverse understanding of Midwest history. And the last objective um, was to contribute to the digital toolbox that these communities were already using to share and disseminate their histories. And so Descendant Archival Practices is, speaks to my own methodology, but also to the fact that I'm building on work that these communities were already doing to preserve and digitize their own histories. Did you get all three? Yes. Okay. Yes, we got it. And we have another question. Okay. Hello, I have a question for um, both the archivist and, and for you as the, the professor. Um, so you answered my question at the end when you said that the this stool collection is going to be digitized. Um, could you talk a little bit about how did you have your students access the archives before? Did y'all stage like an in-person class for them to go through the collection? How did you go about um, scheduling that and making that happen? Okay, thank you for that. So um, in the beginning of the semester, I believe my students met, it could have been twice, but I know for sure once with Jackie, she introduced the archive, and then they had the opportunity to have a hands on approach with the documents that were there. Afterwards, in class, we spent one day finding what we could outside of what was in the archival collection. And so I told, I showed them how to use Ancestry and other um, online digital databases. And we worked and we worked on a shared Google Doc to add everything that we found. And so again, we went to the archives in the beginning of the semester, and then we worked collaboratively to research what we could find based off what was in the collection, but speaking to some of those archival silences. And then they were all encouraged to, and they actually had to visit the archives on their own to complete most of the assignments. Thank you so much for your um, information for your presentation. Um, I was actually a consultant on a community archiving project that grew out of one of those Facebook groups, like you were discussing. And one of the reasons uh, for this project was I think that there was concern about what happens when you post materials on Facebook. Because, you know, according to their rules and their regulations, they actually have the right to use your materials. And so I think there was a concern that communities would become exploited for their materials. And I was just wondering if that was something that you um, addressed or discussed when you were also working with some of these communities. Mm -hmm. And so the, the reason why I, uh, another reason why I wanted to do the history harvest, and this was building off of work that other historians at IU, where I was doing my dissertation at, and, and across the Midwest have been doing with the history harvest. But for me, who was working closely with these descendant communities, I was concerned about long-term sustainability. And I'll give you a really great example of that. So I talked about this um, community a few weeks ago, and I reached out to one of the descendants. The only way we've been in contact for the last four years has been through Facebook. Her Facebook page was hacked. So I reached out to her to ask for a photo of a document she had shared with me. And she told me, I don't have anything. My Facebook, I don't have anything anymore. My Facebook page was hacked. And so one reason why I wanted to do the history harvest was for them to be able to preserve um, their documents long term. One thing that continued to come up when we were in the planning stages and trying to persuade individuals that they had objects significant enough to contribute to the history harvest was what would happen to those documents and those artifacts. And we did not hold on to anything. So they kept ownership of all of their um, documents and artifacts. We just digitized them at one event and gave them back to them. So um, 
I don't think that the issue with, I don't think that they have been thinking much about the issue with Facebook, but as I started to do the work, I do see that as, um, I mean, I have to acknowledge that the possibility of erasure and things being lost by using um, Facebook as a platform. And so when I did this in the past, when I did the History Harvest in the past, what we used was GitHub and other individuals have used Omeka. Thank Got one question. Uh, hold on one second. Hi, this is a great presentation. I was just wondering if the uh, students' um, essay ass assignments were being preserved in any way or provided online. Thank you for that, because I am still thinking about that. So I've reached out to a few of my students who are doing great work. And I'm starting to think, and this is only the very beginning stages of us thinking about a website or um, digitizing Sewell's collection. But I do think that if we move forward with the website, one part of the website should be how students have engaged with it and examples of those assignments. And so I'll ask some of my students for permission. A lot of them are graduating um, this year for, for permission to use their assignments on the website. But I'm not exactly um, sure what the website will entail outside of like the digitized um, items in her collection. But I would like for it to do more. And so I'm open to suggestions. And, and maybe Jackie can even speak to her vision for what the website can look like. Well, I, I think Candace is also going to also um, work with us on the website. I think the website would focus on her. <laughs> Candace, please feel free to chime in. I think the, folk, the website will focus on her history, um, some, some biographical information. Maybe Jasmine students have discovered things on ancestry that we don't know. It may be applicable for this website. So that's my vision. Most, you know, we, we're archivists, so we think about history. And this. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, yeah, we definitely um, want to have um, a great website for for digital digitizing all of the, the materials from the collection. Um, but um, I personally would love to be able to keep some of the, the student assignments that have come out of the, the student engagement with the collection, um, whether that's part of the website or maybe we create like just a separate collection in our archives that's, you know, like the, the student projects relating to the Jenny Elder School collection and sort of connecting them in that way. Um, I think we would really love to, to keep that kind of stuff and have a record of it. I think that'd be amazing. That is a really great idea, Candace, that I had not thought about. So thank you. Do we have any questions from uh, anyone on Zoom? Okay, I guess we're out of questions. <laughs> Any more questions? Well, thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you everyone for being here.